Hello everyone, I'm just waiting for Laura to join me and then we'll get started. And here she is. Um, as director of the Refugee Studies Centre, I'd like you to welcome you to the 2020 Elizabeth Colson Lecture. Our lecture this year is online due to the extraordinary circumstances of the COVID-19 epidemic. That means our audience has much longer hair than usual, uh, but it also means we've got a much, much bigger audience, which I think is a fantastic thing for this uh, big event in the RSC's annual calendar. Let me start with a few words about the woman after whom this lecture is named. Elizabeth Colson, who passed away in 2016, aged 99, was an esteemed anthropologist based at the University of California at Berkeley. In, in an unusually lengthy academic career that took her from studying Japanese World War II relocation camps in Arizona to the long-term effects of displacement in modern day Zambia, Elizabeth Colson researched in intricate detail the social effects of resettlement and dislocation. The work for which she is perhaps most renowned is her decades long study of almost 60,000 Gwembe Tongan people living in the Gwembe Valley in Zambia and Zimbabwe, who were forced to relocate to make way for a dam on the Zambezi River. The book of this study, The Social Consequences of Resettlement, is a unique and powerful contribution to understanding the long-term communal consequences of displacement. In addition to her direct research contribution, it should also be noted that Professor Colson was also a key supporter of the Refugee Studies Centre, particularly in its early days under Barbara Harold Bond. So this annual lecture, an ongoing tribute to one of the true pioneers in the field of forced migration. Since 1996, many esteemed academics have given this lecture, including James Scott, Saskia Sassen, Lisa Melke, and Alan McFarlane. Tonight's Colson lecture, the 25th, will be given by another highly respected academic, Professor Laura Hammond. Our speaker tonight is, like Elizabeth Colson, an anthropologist who's contributed greatly to the study of forced migration in Africa. Laura Hammond is Professor of Development Studies at SOAS, the University of London. She has over the last two decades made a wide ranging academic contribution on subjects including food security, conflict, forced migration and diasporas. Her book, This Place Will Become Home, Refugee Repatriation to um, Ethiopia, is a standard reference for those who wish to understand refugee return and her many articles on refugees return and movement in the Horn of um, Africa have made her an indispensable scholar in the field. But what's really rare about Laura is that she is an anthropologist who is able to combine in-depth ethnographic research in the Horn of Africa with systematic policy engagement. Consistent with this, she serves in a number of important roles, including as head of the London International Development Centre's Migration and Leadership Team, as team leader for the Research and um, Evidence Facility, Horn of Africa window of the European Union Trust Fund for um, Africa. And she also serves as chair of the Independent Advisory Group for Country Information which um, advises the independent chief inspector of borders and immigration in the UK. She's also done consultancy work for a range of different development and humanitarian organizations, including UNDP, USAID, Oxfam, Médecins Sans Frontières, the International Committee of the Red Cross and the World Food Programme. Understandably then, given her vast experience, she was an extremely popular choice for this afternoon's lecture. Before I hand over to her, let me say that for reasons of quality, apart from the Laura you see in front of you now, um, we'll be watching a pre-recorded version of this lecture. There will then be live questions 
to the speaker at the end of this talk. You can start submitting questions as soon as the talk begins through the Q&A button on your screen. Um, and as I want to get through as many of these questions as I can, please try to keep them as short and pithy as possible. But now let me pass over to Professor Hammond to speak on mobility and immobility in the time of coronavirus, reflections from long-term study of migration and displacement. Over to you, Laura. Thanks, Matt. Matt. That's a really kind introduction. Um, I will let the video really speak for itself. I just wanted to say um, it's a video we made yesterday. Uh, and um, so it's almost in real time, but not quite. Uh, there are still the various glitches. You'll almost feel as if it is real. Um, uh, maybe we'll have a quiz at the end to see who can spot the interruptions during the course of the film. Um, but uh, I'm very much here, alive, and listening on with you, which is an agonizing process. And I look forward to the discussion, which of course will be live. So um, that's, I, uh, let's catch up at the, at the end of the lecture. Thank you. It's a real honor to be asked to give the Elizabeth Coulson lecture this year. I started my career in refugee and forced migration studies uh, at the University of Oxford at the Refugee Studies Program, as it was then called, back in 1989, when I worked with Barbara Harrell Bond and Belinda Allen and many others uh, for a year before I went to graduate school. Um, that's a job that I left and which Dominique Atala took over. And as many of you who know the RSC well will know, she's been there ever since and has only just retired this past year. I was hoping to be able to meet her today to wish her well. Um, and so I'll have to just send this message through the medium of this lecture uh, to wish Dominique all the best in her retirement. When I was at uh, the Refugee Studies Center, I had the privilege of being able to meet Elizabeth Colson several times. I can't really claim to have been, uh, to, know, to have known her very well, but I do remember her amazing presence. She was a very small woman, uh, very short, um, but she had this penetrating gaze and really direct, uh, no-nonsense questions that always could sniff out nonsense at any, at any turn. She certainly didn't suffer fools gladly, um, but she kept people on their toes. I remember that Barbara used to tell a story about how uh, at one point Elizabeth had said to her, is there anything I can do to help you to build up the refugee studies program? And Barbara had said, well, if you ever have time, you could come to Oxford and spend time with us and, and um, help us build up the center. And before she knew it, one day Elizabeth arrived with several very large suitcases and was ready to spend the next several months working side by side with Barbara to, to help build the Refugee Studies Center into what it is today, which is really the world's premier center and community for people who are involved with refugees and forced migration studies. What I wanted to do in thinking about Elizabeth, uh, and I want, I want to kind of use her as a muse in a way to unpack some thinking that I've been engaged in, uh, as we all have been engaged in thinking about this pandemic and what does it mean in terms of our own work and in terms of our personal engagement with the places uh, in which we work and the communities and people with which we work. And I thought there are, I mean, there are several kinds of things that we can take away from Elizabeth's work. Um, she spent 70 years working in, with the Gwembe Tonga in, in Zambia um, through the end of the colonial period into the independence period. And um, when, when one looks at the massive corpus of her work, you can see the incredible attention to detail, the incredible uh, sense with which, care with which she listened to what people had to say to her, uh, her bravery and her, her courage to stand up to uh, positions, people in people and in institutions and in positions of power when she felt that injustice was being done. Uh, whether that was a colonial administration, a uh, government, an international organization, or whatever it was. Um, she also had a keen and very strong commitment to learning from what people are doing. How do people respond to crisis? How do people respond to the kinds of challenges that are put in their way? And that's something that, of course, she shared very strongly with Barbara Harrell Bond 
and it's something that the Refugee Studies Center has been founded on. That, if anything, that principle of uh, learning from what refugees and forced migrants uh, have to say about their own experience has to be the starting point for the kinds of work that we do. So I want to take some of those principles and think about how can that inform our own response and our own thinking about this current global pandemic, COVID-19. Uh, I'll do that partly through thinking about the region with which I have the most experience. Uh, I certainly can't claim to have had 70 years of uh, engagement in a single area, but I was, have been working in the Horn of Africa for 30 years, almost 30 years, uh, in a variety of different contexts and, and, and different countries, different places. Um, but I, I, well, we'll see. I'll take my my hat, my take my tip from Elizabeth and see uh, whether, in the course of this next uh, forty minutes, I can do justice to some of the principles that I have learned from people like her. So, just to start us off, here we have a map of the COVID nineteen pandemic as of this month, June twenty twenty. Uh, this shouldn't be a, a surprise to really to anyone, uh, but. It's important to kind of pause for a moment and think about where we are. We're living in an age of um, this, this, what sometimes people are saying, some people are saying might be the first in a series of different pandemics. We don't, we don't really know. But at the moment, more than a quarter of the world has been in some form of lockdown. The pandemic has moved from, from Asia through to Europe, where it's now subsiding and is now taking it root in Latin America, Central America. Um, it seems to be stagnating a bit in the US, it's moving from one region to the next. And, uh, and, and certainly, even though we might say in our own, in my own world, where I've been living now for 15 weeks, uh, in a state of pretty much pretty self-imposed uh, isolation, um, competing with my children and my husband for Wi-Fi, doing my fair share of homeschooling and homeworking, um, going a little bit crazy with by staying inside. Now, uh, in in the UK at least, and in many parts of Europe, things are starting to open up. Uh, shops are opening. Um, we were able to get around a bit more and it feels a little bit like the crisis is subsiding, but it's really important to recognize that globally and in many parts of the world, it's not at all subsiding, um, that the numbers are still very high and the danger is still very high. And even here in the UK, the danger is still very high of, of a relapse if people do not take care. But just this last weekend uh, on um, June 20th, it was World Refugee Day, and the World Health Organization Director General Tedros Adhanom announced that um, the numbers of new cases reported had hit an all-time high at over 150,000 cases, which is just a reminder of the fact that um, this global pandemic is still very alive, still very much a problem, and, um, and is preying upon those who are the weakest and the poorest uh, throughout the world, not least of which um, refugees and forced migrants. It's also important to, to recognize now that so far there haven't been the kinds of outbreaks that we have been afraid that might happen in, in particularly in crowded refugee settings, uh, which is good news, but certainly not a reason to be complacent. Um, when I think about the region that I've worked in the most, the Horn of Africa, I'm, I'm focusing on particularly the seven countries of the Horn of Africa that make up the Intergovernmental Authority on Development. Uh, or EGAD. So that's Djibouti, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Kenya, Somalia, South Sudan, Sudan, and Uganda. Um, sorry, those, so that's eight countries now, with South Sudan, actually. Uh, the, the Horn of Africa region is home to more than 8 million internally displaced people and more than 4 million refugees. A much larger but unknown number relies on movement for, for a variety of different reasons, whether it's pastoral transhumance, seasonal labor migration or mobility between rural and urban places. This is a region of incredible mobility, people on the move for all sorts of reasons. Uh, I've been involved for the last almost four years with a research program uh, together with Oliver Bakewell, who used to be at Oxford, and um, colleagues at Sahan Research based in Nairobi, looking at 
migration within the region, um, looking at the different reasons and, and causes, drivers, dynamics related to migration, and it's a, it's a very rich area, uh, unfortunately, in some cases to look at displacement, but it's also a story of incredible mobility, which is not necessarily a, a, a problematic story, I might say. I'll come back to that in, in a little while. Um, the first reports of COVID in the region started to be reported in, in March 2020. All countries since then have instituted some kind of border closure or restrictions of people, but not necessarily of commercial goods. Flights into countries have been restricted, if not cut off completely. Um, there have been varying levels of lockdown, including school closures, evening curfews, uh, bans on gatherings of, of large groups of people and uh, an attempt to try to stop the virus from spreading. But as we can see, um, we have um, you know, 18,000, almost 19,000 confirmed cases as of last week. Um, these figures, of course, should be taken as absolute minimum because there is very, sm very low capacity for testing. Most people suffer from the disease and either recover or in some cases even die without ever being counted. So these are really the lowest numbers that we can rely on. There is, um, EGAT has been tracking on a daily basis the number of active cases in the Horn of Africa. Their numbers are slightly different from those that I showed in the last slide from IOM. But it shows a very steady uh, increase in the numbers of reported cases since the middle of March. And uh, one of the key takeaways from this is that the curve is not not going down at any uh, by any means. This, the the rate of the increase is slowing down very slightly, but uh, we're still on an upward traje trajectory. So um, the region has not yet seen the peak of its uh, experience with COVID-19. The ways in which the region have responded uh, have been largely to focus on trying to protect health staff and to isolate those with suspected or confirmed uh, cases. For most health facilities, Things like expensive ventilators, oxygen, other kinds of life support, life supporting equipment are really either non-existent or in very short supply. And so the emphasis has been on the health front, at least, to focus on providing protective, equi protective equipment and educating people as much as possible about the need for hand washing, social distancing, et cetera. The problem, however, is that very often educating people is, is not really enough. We know that. Um, we know that many people live in environments in which it's just not possible to socially isolate or, or separate and where basic water and soap and sanitation facilities are woefully inadequate. And this is no more, uh, no truer in a refugee camp than, than anywhere else. Um, so those who are confined to camps or settlements in some cases who are excluded from entering cities uh, find that their lives are constrained and really that the term of forced immobility becomes um, really salient here. A recent mixed migration center report indicated that between 80 to 90 percent of refugees and migrants, uh, and this was based on work done in Kenya and in Somaliland, knew about the coronavirus and they knew how they could protect themselves and they were worried about contracting it. But only about a third of the respondents said that they thought they could actually access health care if they needed it due to the high costs, the long distances they would have to travel to get to those centers, etc. So people have a really stark choice. They can either risk not eating today or this week, or they can take the chance that a disease that they don't have never really seen the face of uh, might come to get them in a few weeks a disease that they've been told you might recover from without any problem, only a minority of people actually have severe complications or die from it. And so with a calculus like that, it's very easy to make the decision that you'll take your chances and uh, risk maintaining your mobility, getting out, trying to find some way of supporting your family uh, in the meantime. In this um, same study, around 65% said that they had reduced access to work even those the, who were moving around, and nearly 80% said they could not afford basic goods to, to purchase basic goods for their families. Although the sum of this number said that they had changed their travel or destination plans if they were on the move, the Horn of Africa is, particularly with forced migrants, tends to be a place where people are, um, a lot of people are uh, maintaining uh, 
their own protracted displacement kind of residence in long-term residence in a refugee camp or in a IDP center somewhere near a city, a minority of people are actually on the move intending to go somewhere else. This same study, though, talked about um, the uh, interviewed people in Niger and Libya who, in fact, had said that they'd had to change their destinations or had become stuck in the places that they were planning to pass through, unable to move further on. So when we think about the impact of the COVID-19 um, on, on a region like the Horn of Africa broadly, where you've got large refugee populations of Somalis, of South Sudanese, you have people leaving Eritrea going through uh, Ethiopia and Sudan, some aiming to get further away, uh, and some more looking for localized settlements. Um, you can see that there are obviously there are the short term kind of health impacts or short term health areas of focus where you're trying to prevent the spread. But I think that the, the wider impact on a region like this is in the economic sector. So we know that uh, labor migrants in Kenya, for instance, have had to return home to their areas as demand for flowers has collapsed. This is a photograph of, of roses in Kenya being uh, disposed of, not because of the economic impact so much in Kenya as uh, because of the collapse in demand from European countries to purchase these flowers from, from Kenya. And so therefore we see the interconnected nature of labor markets in countries within the Horn uh, being hugely dependent on what's happening on a wider um, international scale. And that will have an impact on the availability of, of jobs, on uh, think about the new industrial parks in Ethiopia and the extent to which they're involved in making textiles for export. Um, a, a large global recession will have an impact on the ability of those companies to maintain employment opportunities for people as well. We think about other kinds of economic impacts, such as the potential cancellation of the Hajj this year, which would destroy the livestock market for Somali herders and traders throughout the region. Um, that would also could also have knock-on effects in terms of the kinds of environmental impacts that would happen from uh, increased herd sizes that are unable to be um, sort of uh, liquidated. Uh, through the market, the annual marketing that farmers and, and pastoralists have come to rely on. There are political costs as well, of course, economic. Uh, Ethiopia has had to postpone its own elections indefinitely, uh, causing a, a tension between the northern region of Tigray, which has insisted that it will have elections unilaterally, despite whether or not the central center goes ahead. Uh, there are questions around what will happen to the election in Somalia as well. And those elections can have very significant and quite direct impacts on the plight of refugees, re refugee returnees and IDPs living in Somalia, many of whom belong to minority clans and are living in a kind of dual state of, um, uh, of fragility as a result of their own sort of displacement status, as well as the fact that they are not able to lay claim to a full set of, of rights and privileges uh, that many other citizens are because of the 4.5, what's called the 4.5 clan formula that's currently in place. And there's no way that the 4.5 clan formula will be um, changed without a new government coming in and finishing the constitutional revision process that's been in place. So you can see how this pandemic is having all of these kind of domino knock-on effects on other areas, wider areas and spheres within the region. Another area in which what happens in a place like the Horn of Africa ha is directly tied to the economics of what's happening and the impacts of the pandemic more globally is in the area of remittances. Um, I've done a lot of uh, research on remittances, both in sending countries as well as in receiving countries. And it's clear that this kind of, of crisis that's currently affecting uh, the Horn of Africa is having almost, I would say, an unprecedented impact on the flow of remittances. So in under normal circumstances, you have a situation where there's a humanitarian need that emerges within, within the horn. There's a flood, there's a drought, uh, there's locust infestation. All of these kinds of things can have an immediate impact on the, the recipient, the family sort of back home, if you like, or in the country of origin. And so remittances 
are often mobilized to be able to help people to get through that difficult period. Now you have a situation where the crisis is on both ends of the chain, where the people who are sending money are also those who are losing their jobs, who have in some cases been very heavily impacted by uh, the pandemic itself here in, in the UK. Um, the Somali community, for instance, has been really deeply affected by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Many, many people have, have been ill. Many, sadly, many people have lost their lives. And it's placed huge strain on the diaspora community here to be able to, uh, to not be able to send money back to uh, their families. In the work that we've done previously, this is where this kind of long-term focus on research the long-term lessons of research can be useful. We know that approximately 40% of Somalis receive remittances, somewhat higher, about 50% in urban centers and, and fewer in rural centers, but both rural and urban communities are dependent on remittances. And now we have uh, predictions from the World Bank, for instance, that there may be a 20% drop in remittances over the next year. So what will that look like for the communities that depend on them? Further information about the way that remittances flow leads us to know that, for instance, in Somali communities, about 80% of those who receive remittances receive from one, one person, one relative. Now, if, that, if anything happens to that one person, if they lose their job, if they become sick, or they have to start caring for other relatives, immediate family who are nearby, and are now no longer able to send either as much or as often, oh, and there goes my telephone, and I'm going to have to pause here so I can answer it. I'm going to start over by, uh, my phone was ringing, so I'm not sure if we can edit that bit out, but I hope we can. Um, but I was just saying that uh, Somali families are dependent on that one relative, that, that, that one person who can send remittances. And if those, that person who's not able to send uh, or has to, ha, who can send only much less uh, funding or less money, less frequently, um, that places huge strain on the recipient families who have come to rely on remittances. We know um, as well, uh, we've, uh, there have been already some reports coming from Ethiopia that in the last quarter, remittances may have already dropped by as much as 70% uh, coming back into the country. So this is a widespread kind of impact on remittances that may even go far beyond what the World Bank is recording uh, or predicting in it on a global level. Some people in, in, here in London, we have many people who would send money by going to a local storefront um, my local fabric shop in, in uh, Shepherd's Bush is the place where I go when I need to send uh, money to friends in, in Somalia. Uh, and those shops are, of course, closed now. So that's, there's been a shifting of, of um, practice whereby people are sending funding through um, their um, uh, sending money electronically in some cases. And that works for a lot of people, particularly for younger people, people who have more computer literacy, who people who feel more comfortable about mobile money moving. Uh, it's not a solution necessarily for everyone, particularly for those who are undocumented, who don't have the, the correct um, documentation, uh, photographic evidence of who they are, what they need in order to register for such services. It also um, is not ideal for older people who really just may not trust the idea of being able to send money electronically in that way. Um, to through a website to, rather than working with someone they don't really know. So it's a real, um, it's a real problem, the, the level of remittances uh, falling. Similarly, um, or, or maybe alternatively, we should say that despite the fact that there has been a drop in remittances uh, globally, there have been some really inspiring examples of ways in which people have used their own skills, if they have them, uh, their money, their time uh, to try to help uh, communities in countries of origin to withstand and to, to deal with this crisis as it comes. Just to give an example, um, uh, just and it's because I know it very well, I'm a trustee of the Edna Adam Foundation, which is a maternity hospital based in Hargeisa in Somaliland. And we've been running um, together with a group called Somali Interhealth, a series of fundraisers to get personal protective equipment to send back to Somaliland, as well as um, 
working to try to get information back. So, so something as that is not necessarily simple, but is really effective and doesn't cost a lot to send is information. So these amazing um, Somali, Somali heritage, but UK based um, health workers have been putting in incredibly long hours, up to 14 hour shifts in their jobs within the NHS. And when they come home, they've been recording lectures, developing training materials. And last weekend they held this uh, webinar to try to help Somali professionals inside Somalia and Somaliland to uh, respond well, uh, to be able to respond well to the kinds of cases that they're seeing. Uh, to be well prepared, to be well prepared to manage cases, but also to be well prepared to protect themselves and to know how this uh, virus acts, because we know that it has, it absolutely preys upon those who are exposed, those who are, um, uh, who ha you know, who are, are susceptible. Um, and so there are a whole range of important health messages that go beyond washing hands and, and uh, using equi effective equipment that can um, help to uh, make, really make the communities more prepared um, in their areas of origin. So that's a really inspiring example of how diasporas and have been reaching across many people who are themselves former refugees who have been um, able to um, respond well to, you know, to the kinds of crises and, and, and even to look beyond the pandemic as it felt here in the UK at, at some of the worst periods, these these amazing people, many of them who were women, were um, working together to try to, um, to help people back home. So this kind of going through, thinking about these different kinds of impacts that there are in different places um, and, and the ways in which the, the coronavirus is kind of unpacking itself in a variety of different parts of life, the health, sort of the health sector, the economic sector, the political sector, um, makes me think about the ways in which um, the policies towards uh, movement have been, have been played out in this particular area. So what we can see very much is a, a policy of sedentarism, of kind of almost forced sedentar sedentarism. Um, and this is one of my, my first kinds of observations where approaches to the slowing, slowing the spread of COVID-19 really tend to replicate the failures of migration, refugee and development policies that would seek to keep people in place. So we've had border closures, we've had closures, confined to the settlements in which they live, not being able to travel out to cities to find work, a whole host of different kinds of mechanisms that that send the message that mobility is dangerous and bad and that those who engage in mobility are dangerous and to be stopped and to be criticized and to be feared in some cases. And so that that playing back against the, the kind of um, cr the reifying of this idea of the other, the, the kind of using the migrants as scapegoats, in fact, for wider fears related to the spread of this pandemic uh, are really um, prevalent throughout the region. And it's something that's not new with the arrival of the, the pandemic. The migration and development policy tends to see migration as a problem to be solved or to be avoided. We hear that people are on the move because they're poor, because they cannot find a job, they can't feed their families. So development actors think, what should we do? We should try to create jobs. If we create jobs, then people won't move anymore. In the work that we are doing with the research and evidence facility and together with uh, Oliver Bakewell, we've been looking at actually, well, what happens when you give people the opportunities to get skills or to get jobs? Does that result in fewer people wanting to move? In fact, of course, and this will surprise probably no one, it doesn't mean that people don't decide they don't want to move, but it, what it does do is it gives them a skill. It gives them a skill to be able to think about where they want to move, to be able to choose where they want to move, and to be able to move safely. So when people, so, so the idea is that mobility itself is not the problem. Mobility becomes a problem when it's unsafe or when it's forced. But our policies, which we aim, we aim at, even our poverty, poverty alleviation policies, are really aimed at trying to kind of lock people into place. And I think we need to move beyond that. Um, 
when you find that people come out of these vocational training programs uh, and have the aspiration to move, we find that when they have a choice of where they go, in fact, what they tend to do is to move more locally. They move to the nearest city where they can find a job, where they can use their skill. They want to tend to want to stay close to their social networks, to their families, to their friends. They don't have an aspiration typically to move. In the, the research, the surveys that we've been doing recently, we've asked people, having come out of these kinds of schemes, what, what do you want to do with yourself? Where do you want to go? Their aspirations are overwhelmingly local. Um, and they are not necessarily the same kinds of people as we see who are moving longer distances, say from Europe towards, or from Af the Horn of Africa towards Europe. Those are a different population of people who are typically either fleeing because they have to, because they are refugees, and they have a well-founded fear of persecution wherever they are coming from, and where they can't stop anywhere along the way very often, they're, they're herded on. Um, or they tend to be relatively well-educated middle-class people who have an aspiration to do something more with that skill. And that's a very small percentage of the overall population who are ultimately in that position to, be able to make those kinds of moves. But when we think about the similarities between migration and development policy, we can see that the policy responses to COVID are contributing to this casting of movement as problematic, particularly where efforts to constrain movement take place without at the same time addressing the vulnerability of mobile populations. So locking people inside camps, closing borders, but also at the same time preventing them from being able to access essential health care, the, the kind of double whammy, if you like, that, um, that really un, undoes even the best humanitarian and development work that's been taking place over the last several years. The, the second point I wanted, the kind of broader, wider pick point I wanted to make is that uh, that the kinds of um, international commitments that have been made in recent years have tended to focus on wanting to be, wanting to have a wider and more inclusive approach towards thinking about uh, refugees and migrants, um, people on the move. So for instance, in 2016, the New York Declaration, which really set the stage for the framing of the, both the Global Compact on Refugees and the Global Compact on Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration, declared we, we declared that we wish to see the Sustainable Development Goals and their targets met for all nations and peoples and for all segments of society. We also said that we would endeavor to reach the furthest behind first. So think about that in terms of what is happening now with the, with the articulation of, of COVID-19 kind of policies, particularly relating to migration and to those who are on the move. Thinking about the Global Compact on Refugees has an explicit um, commitment to expand and enhance the quality of national health systems to facilitate access by refugees and host communities. The idea is in the Comprehensive Refugee Response Framework that's been um, the kind of operational plan for the Global Compact on Refugees has been to take what might be called a whole of society approach where refugees and host communities and IDPs and um, are be all given the same sort of entitlements, the same kinds of assistance, support, protection, regardless of what kind of category they fall into. And there have been some incredible success stories in the Horn of Africa region uh, in this respect. At the Global um, Refugee Forum in December, uh, there was a real emphasis on the success stories that the EGAD region had to tell the rest of the world about the progress made in terms of inclusion of refugees in base, access to basic services and on employment and, and uh, jobs and livelihoods areas. But with COVID-19, there's a real danger of backtracking, of losing that progress that's been made. This, I think, is really the first big test for the Global Compact for Refugees and the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration. Because if we can't provide systems that prevent, that, that in, provide an inclusive approach towards people when they need it, who are in times of crisis, then what, what good actually are these compacts? What kinds of value can they have if the small steps that have been made even over the last 18 months can, can be eroded so quickly when we see this first time we see a, a crisis coming? So I really quite actually. So what can we take from the lessons of Elizabeth Coulson as we confront this challenge? 
First, we can learn a lot about how to deal with the present from looking at the past, from learning how people respond to crises, how they manage their lives, what their own priorities are. As I said at the beginning of this lecture, the Refugee Study Center is built on that principle more than any other. And it's great to see recent work that's being done on the ways in which refugees help themselves, the ways in which organizations, um, refugee-sponsored organizations work together to, to, to support themselves. But that's an, an, uh, a central tenet of all of our work, not just at the Refugee Study Center, but all of us who are engaged in this kind of research who re need to really commit to that and to pushing that forward into the policy sphere as well. I think also second, learning from the past involves listening to people and not just listening, but decentering power. We need to be hearing at this early stage in the pandemic, and these are still early stages, not just from the health professionals, which absolutely we need to be hearing from, but as well from economists, anthropologists, education specialists, other kinds of, of thinkers who can use the knowledge they have about the places they're working, and they have been working for long periods of time, to think now about what are the what are the what's the comprehensive package of of needs that people have what are the challenges that they're facing and how are those likely to pay, play out over over the coming period so i just would leave with a few kinds of recommendations one is that important thing about needing to go know about the long thinking we need to be thinking about the long term effects of this pandemic now we need to think about the ways in which those those effects are are going to be unraveling uh, and the way that they present themselves now in the way that they're likely to unravel into the future. We need to also think about the ways in which our policies, whether humanitarian or development or COVID related, um, need to be need to support mobility rather than prevent it. People, of course, there's a need to in some ways to try to contain the spread of this virus. But as a long term strategy, that doesn't work. We know that people have to move. They're going to move in order to protect themselves and their families from other things besides the virus. And that is simple isolation is not going to work. We also need to take this as an opportunity to change the way that policy thinks, to make it more sensitive towards mobility, to think about providing protection without locking people in place. That's a broader thing than just thinking about COVID response, but I think as well, using it as an opportunity and opening of a door to thinking about what are the other ways in which development and migration and refugee policy inadvertently sometimes tries to lock people in place, whether because of security concerns, whether because of public health concerns, because of economic concerns, to try to deal with those and try, try to understand that people need to move and we need to try to find ways of policies to enable people to move safely with dignity uh, and with choice. This means in really concrete terms that borders have to be opened as soon as possible to permit people to resume their mobile livelihood strategies. I was encouraged today to hear that Kenya is going to reopen its airspace to international flights and not going to require uh, quarantine once people arrive in the country. That's great for the privileged who will be flying into country. But what about for others who are, who are crossing borders in other kinds of ways? Uh, what I hope this is the beginning of a widening and a more permissive a return to a more permissive movement. And let's not forget that in the Horn of Africa, prior to the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, there was actually quite a lot of movement towards um, a kind of free freedom of movement protocol that EGAD has been shepherding for quite some time. And so it's important to make sure that we don't backtrack on that as well, that the, the mobility between countries, the interlinkages, interlocking linkages between the different countries um, are allowed to, to flourish in that way. And finally, I would just um, say that it's really important that we recognize that many of the steps that have been taken, whether in Europe, in North America, and other places, might make sense scientifically, technologically, technically, in terms of um, trying to stop the spread of the pandemic. And absolutely, some of them need to be adapted, I would say, in, in the countries like the ones I've been talking about. But they very often have to be modified in recognition of the local solutions that are needed and that people are undertaking that reflect their own priorities, their own aspirations, their own ongoing need to engage with livelihood practices, and that they can't, we can't just kind of take an approach that works in one country and slap it onto another uh, and hope that um, we can effectively deal with this, this pandemic and its aftermath effectively. 
That is really what I wanted to say in this lecture. I hope it's come across and made some sort of sense. It's very difficult to do this without looking at your faces. Although this part of the lecture is, going, is recorded, I am going to be live and answering, answering questions as soon as it's finished. So I look forward to hopefully having a discussion um, about whatever you make of this lecture. Thank you very much. You can see me. Can well, see thank you, you very much, Laura. That was a, an amazing um, lecture. And I, I know we can't hear it, but I think if people listen carefully out the windows, they can hear some applause um, emanating from houses. Um, My son's in the next room. I just heard him clapping. So that, I'll take that for a Oh, that's <laughs> excellent. If you've got your children <laughs> on your side, you really are doing well. We have some questions here already, and I'm sure they're going to kind of mount up as um, as we go along, but let's dive into them. I want to start with a couple of questions by Ruby Ziegler. And uh, perhaps you could take these questions, these two together anyway. His first one is, what extent did the African Union attempt to harmonize policies um, across states in the region, presumably in relation to uh, COVID, coordinating human and goods inspection measures? Um, and secondly, um, how are non-citizens in the Horn of African states treated in terms of access to services, social support, um, in comparison to citizens? Do you want to start with that one? Um, Sorry, the last part was non-citizens versus citizens? Exactly. So basically, how are non-citizens doing? Is that a relevant divide? Here? Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, before I start, also, I should say, that just as we've been, as I've been, as I was speaking on the video, um, the research program that I direct, the Research and Evidence Facility, uh, released a, a new report on COVID-19 and mobility, conflict and development in the Horn. Um, and it draws on research from my colleague, Luisa Brain here at SOAS, but also um, from several of our, our researchers that we've been working with who are based in the region and they've been sending in kind of updates as we've been, um, as this whole pandemic has been unfolding. So. Um, it's got a lot more detail and it's a lot richer than what I was able to cover in this period. I would refer you to that. But some um, great questions around, around, around the African Union. I and mean, certainly um, there's been an attempt to try to coordinate, to share information, um, to learn from, from best practice in a way. I think what's perhaps more relevant for the Horn, um, even though the AU is based in Addis Ababa, but the, but the Horn's in terms of operational um, coordination, I think the Intergovernmental Authority on Development probably plays a larger role in terms, because it's able to bring together the key heads of state or key ministries from the, member, from the regional member states. And so quite early on in this pandemic, the ministers of health got together. Um, I think they've had couple, uh, several different um, consultations right now to try to harmonize their own approach um, vis-a-vis -vis border crossings, closure of airspace, um, testing facilities, and, and those kinds of things. So um, I think regional institutions like the AU and like EGAD have a really important role to play in this regard, for sure, um, at, at kind of creating, well, creating a, a playing field, in a sense, partly for political will um, to be mobilized and maintained, but also for information to be shared and kind of a harmonization of approaches to be taken as much as is possible. So it's a, it's a really key question. The one around non-citizens versus citizens is absolutely crucial as well. I mean, what I was trying to get across in that slide on the global compacts was, you know, that and, and the sustainable development goals is that you can't have two different policies towards citizens and non-citizens. If you have, to, if you take seriously the commitment to leave no one behind, which the sustainable development goals is based on, then that has to apply to everyone, everyone within a country, whether they're citizens or non-citizens. And so, you know, unlike the, the Millennium um, Development Goals, the Sustainable Development Goals actually do talk a little bit about migration as an issue, not enough to my liking, but it's a consultative process and a consensual process. So, but, but it's really important that, that the same approach is, is made 
to people, whether or not they are citizens, whether or not they're even documented. So that applies to refugee populations, it applies to not stateless people, to, to guest workers, a whole range of different kinds of, um, of categories. And what we've seen is that um, in many cases, there's been not just a, a formal um, kind of hardening of borders, closing of borders, and in some cases, a, a lack of access on the part of non-citizens to basic health services and other kinds of support, uh, but also a more generally a kind of um, hostility and opposition to foreign workers, foreign refugees, others who are in the country um, uh, who are not citizens, are just on the part of the general public. So it's not just a, a thing that governments need to do, it's also about sensitizing the general public to um, having that more accepting stance. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Laura. Um, so here's another uh, question for you. Um, and this one um, is from Denise Kachi Kafali. He says, do you think that the lack of remittances and the problems you spelled out there, the difficulty of passing those through, will drive people towards irregular migration towards receiving countries? Um, and just to twin that with another question, um, this is by Noor Muhammad Sheikh. Um, the question here is given that all remittance, I mean, all the remittance sending countries, the US, the EU and the Gulf are facing serious recession. Do you see governments in these countries putting stringent measures in place for money to go out? Therefore, in that way, disrupting the flow of remittances. Um, and the comment here is that uh, remittance have been criminalized before and just wondering whether that might be possible if circumstances become uh, severe enough. Okay, thanks. Um, um, so in regard to the first question um, about whether or not lack of remittances is likely to lead to more irregular migration, I would suspect, I mean, it goes back to the point I was trying to make about um, the kinds of, when we, when we, all of the information we've had of years and years of studying um, migration and displacement in a region like the Horn suggests that the poorest of the poor are not those who are traveling long distances. They're not able, they're not able, and in some cases they're not, they don't have the aspiration to travel outside the region. So their, their migration and displacement pathways are more towards the nearest city or the nearest refugee camp or the nearest any place so, somewhat close by that can support them. So I would imagine that there could be an increase in irregular migration and other kinds of migration more locally as a result of not having remittances available for sure. But the kind of long, long distance traveling that you might anticipate moving from, from Somalia to Europe, for instance, you can't make that move usually unless you have access to remittances because you have to be able to buy the services of smugglers and others to be able to make the journey. And one of the disturbing trends that we've seen in recent years, however, is a transformation in the smuggling um, network and their practices, whereby uh, it's a kind of travel now, pay later scheme so that people can enter into those pathways with a minimum amount of cash put down with the idea that they will be pay they'll pay either along the way or once they reach their destination. And what happens is that people then get stuck uh, or held up in Libya, for instance, where they're but then their relatives are receive a phone call saying, we have your, your relative. If you want them to be released to continue their journey or to be delivered safely, you have to pay the X amount of money. So it's a complicated m measure. And I wouldn't say nobody will move these long distances uh, because they've lost their remittance money, but that um, I would suspect that more people moving more locally uh, and that, that those, those longer journeys would be only made if you had the assurance that at some point you could call on those remittance funds to be able to support you and to pay for the, the full migration services or the smuggling services. To Noor's question about remittances um, being curtailed, I, don't, I haven't heard of any countries in sort of diaspora countries that are keen on um, trying to prevent money leaving the country necessarily. I think maybe that's because I'm talking to more like development types of people who are concerned and see what, what is happening with the constraints on remittance flows and they are um, keen to try to help facilitate them as much as possible. So, um, I mean, I don't think 
there's not a, a sense of if you let money go out towards re, towards remittances, there's less money in the country to for the country's benefit or anything. Um, but it's a very, I mean, being able to allow remittances to flow in, involves um, decriminalizing the transfer channels and opening up bank accounts for money transfer companies, which is a battle we've been fighting for many, many years. It's also about just getting people secure access to employment and paying them a fair wage so that they have money to be able to send. And those kinds of protections, particularly for people who support themselves in the informal sector in, in countries, in diaspora countries, are often, you know, they're often not able to take advantage of furlough schemes and social support mechanisms. So it's about really helping protect the, the migrant workforce in uh, diaspora countries, I think. Okay, and now a question from Professor Mario Aguia. Um, how can pastoralists, pastoralists contribute to the situation post pandemic? And the comment is, they're some of the most resourceful uh, people at the borders. Um, and maybe I'll twin that again with another um, question. Um, There's a little bit uh, unconnected uh, to the previous one, but it's worth considering anyway. Um, by Noah Mohammed Sheikh. Mm -hmm. um, measures put in place to deal with COVID-19 have affected the movement of humanitarians, peacekeepers and mediators. What long-term impact will this have on, on relations between affected communities and these institutions? Will they be able to reconnect with ease, especially if funding is going to impact these, cent these sectors? Okay, great. Two more great questions. Um, um, uh, Professor Mario is uh, an expert on, on Kenyan pastoralism, so I should ask him the question actually, but I'll give it my best shot. Um, I mean, he's absolutely right that pastoralists are among the most resourceful people on the planet, um, and, but they're people who absolutely need to have mobility uh, in order to, to you know, continue those practices. And a real danger is that when you um, constrain people's movement or you constrain the trade of the livestock um, flows, for instance, or livestock marketing flows, that people will have to abandon pastoralism and move into cities and towns, um, uh, potentially as a permanent livelihood uh, change. And so um, I think it's a, I think that there needs to be a real careful thinking about, amongst governments and, and countries in the Horn all countries in the Horn have a large pastoralist populations. So that's also an area where regional linkages, linkage, regional coordination and information sharing would be really helpful. It's a slightly different issue to think about. I think it's a slightly different issue to think about pastoralism and how to protect pastoralists than it is to think about um, refugees and labor migrants and others. I, someone will say yes, but many of the refugees are themselves former pastoralists. But the point being that when you're talking about protecting a pastoralist livelihood economic system, um, that, that that's about uh, a different set of issues than around forced migration and displacement. So I think in some ways they're, they're slightly they're related but slightly separate discussions as well. Um, and then Noor's question about humanitarians being absent. Um, without wanting to be too cynical, I wonder if that has anything to do with the uh, what, if, that, if that's had any impact on the fact that we haven't actually seen a massive outbreak of COVID-19 in a refugee population, um, that, that many of the um, outsider humanitarians are not there. Um, but uh, be that as it may, I think you're re really right to put, to pinpoint the challenges that will be faced as, as um, expatriates, not even just expatriates, people from cities, uh, national staff who are just not resident in the refugee settings uh, return there. Um, I think that there will be probably an erosion of trust on some hands um, and, and a rebuilding of relationships that will need to be taken up. Uh, I was just the other day in a conversation um, with some researchers doing work on protracted displacement and we were talking about the difficulties of actually restarting our research as researchers, going off and doing surveys, for instance, or doing interviews with people as foreigners, potentially, or as outsiders, um, that there, there might be quite a lot of distrust and, and reticence to even sitting down with us because you know we might carry the virus, absolutely. So I think it's a thing that researchers need to think about together with human, humanitarians and, and development workers and others, but it's, um, 
it would be a mistake and quite foolish to think that one can just arrive and pick up where you left off and have everything uh, be the same because I think you know this is a new a new era and, and we have to be, be sensitive to these issues. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is from Yera, uh, sorry, Jesper uh, Bjarninsen. Um, thank you for your excellent lecture. I'm leaving out a lot of the compliments, if you don't mind. Just to, oh, that's fine. No, that's fine. <laughs> I hope you'll see them again. But thank you, Jesper. <laughs> um, and he says, I agree with your assertion that the pandemic is the first real test of the global compact. Do you think that the current slogan of building back better after the pandemic by development actors is a positive sign of a willingness to think differently? For example, potentially seeing mobility in a different light, or is there a risk of undermining the work already achieved by the compacts? And um, that's a big question, but let me throw in another uh, big okay. question by Alia um, Katan. Um, she's from Yemen. And she says that Yemen is considered a transit area and thousands of refugees from the Horn of Africa. Mm -hmm. um, during the coronavirus, mobility has been seen as bad and dangerous. Uh, people uh, hate those who keep on moving and consider them a source of disease. Mm -hmm. And there's been an increase of hatred and violence against uh, migrants. So her question is really, how can we defend migrants and refugees and help raise awareness in society. So, so I suppose that, that connects with your point about if one is going to, to talk here about um, um, opening up the borders, are we kind of letting ourselves in for more conflict and hostility towards those who move within this particular um, COVID context? Mm, okay, thank you. Um, in some ways, those two questions are kind of related to each other, I think, because, um, I mean, in some ways I hate the term building back better because it's so vague, what does it mean? Um, it can mean a whole variety of different things, but what, what I think it needs to mean in this context has been is that we need, ideally it would be about building back, re-engaging re with development, humanitarian, COVID prevention and, and COVID response uh, and recovery policy in a way that recognizes the central importance of, of mobility the sometimes positive aspects of mobility, that the, the, pe the fact that people move is not a problem, it's the fact that people move unsafely and without choice. That's what I kind of my mantra in some ways these days. Um, and that it's not, so then it, that takes you to the second question, which is, you know, how, how do you get around that hostility? I think it's about taking seriously the, the fact that my mobility is the, can be a positive aspect, but that, that even where, it, where mobility becomes problematic, it's not the people themselves who are problematic. The people themselves who are engaged in movement despite the public health dangers are themselves extremely vulnerable and they need to be seen as vulnerable people who need to be supported in the spirit of the Sustainable Development Goals or the Global Refugee Compact. That um, you know, if people are forced to have no choice but to travel long distances in order to find in, uh, incomes, then, then that's the problem. The problem isn't that they're moving. The problem is a lack of income or a lack of access to resources or a lack of water to be able to protect themselves. I mean, so, you know, you can unpack this in a number of ways, but, but it's about just sort of uncoupling the idea of risk as belonging to the people and saying risk is about um, that, that lack of safety and people are being forced into that position of lack of safety. And that's where we need to provide greater protection, greater uh, support. And that then makes that whole of society approach and the building back better, more migrant, refugee, mobility friendly. Thank you. Um, so next question is from Liz Warren, uh, who works for the IOM. Um, and she'd be interested in your thoughts on how to reopen borders safely and securely. Um, thing that you touched upon in your lecture, but perhaps you could develop that a little bit more. And just to twin that with another question from Melissa um, Weymeyer, do you see any difference in affected, um, sorry, in the effect of COVID on IDPs as compared to refugees? For example, 
IDPs in Mogadishu compared with Sudanese refugees living in Kampala? Okay. Uh, the first question, how to open borders safely, really difficult. Um, you know, I think the way the governments have tended to go about it is to impose some form of, um, if not a quarantine or isolation, at least a kind of surveillance mechanism. And I think that that is probably the best solution. Um, no one's been able to do it very well. And um, whether you get locked up in a, in a cent quarantine center in Nairobi when you arrive, or you um, are come into the UK and say that you're going to be tra tra traceable for two weeks. Um, you know, neither of those seems to be particularly um, effective kind of strategies, but that's not the, it's not that the idea doesn't work, it's that the execution of it, I think, doesn't really work very well. And so I think, you know, for, the, for such a time as, it, as the danger is there, it's right to be concerned about um, kind of people coming in and, and or, or, you know, about the kinds of risks that, that may be associated with mobility, but also then to quickly move beyond that as soon as possible. So it needs to be something that's monitored just as closely as the question of whether we stand two meters apart or one and a half meters apart or one meter apart, or you know, at what point is it safe to open schools? It's also about at what point can we quite quickly move back to a situation where uh, what we're looking at is um, providing, you know, support for people and, and even while those kind of mechanisms are in place whether it's quarantine or it's um, or it's uh, surveillance to try to figure out you know if people are becoming ill it's also about making sure that people who are in those positions have access to the kind of support that they need should they require it should they become ill so that that statistic that I gave where it was you know a lot of people knowing what the risks were knowing what the dangers were but also feeling that if they got sick there was really nowhere to go that's the thing I'm concerned about is that, that people on the move often aren't able to access the kinds of services that, that others citizens who are more sedentary are able to access. Um, question about IDPs and, and versus refugees. I mean, clearly uh, I think IDPs have a huge uh, range of um, added vulnerabilities, one could say. Mostly, uh, most IDPs are not registered in any sense. Most of them are really not served. Um, by any kind of formal protection or assistance. And so because of that, I think they tend to live in greater, uh, a greater risk. That's not to say everyone, not to say all refugees are better off than all IDPs or vice versa, but on the whole, I think the, the IDP population is, has added levels of vulnerability. Um, refugees in camps have certain kinds of vulnerabilities because of the close quarters within which they live. But those who are able to leave camps and live undocumented, integrated into communities may also have certain vulnerabilities as well. So it's about, again, you know, to go back to Elizabeth Colson's kind of careful observation, it's about really understanding the dynamics that pertain to each particular group and understanding their own risk pro profiles based on their situation rather than assigning great generalizations to a whole population of people on the move. Okay, thanks. Let's move on. Um, uh, this is from Melissa Weimeyer. Uh, we often look the role, sorry, we often overlook the role of local authorities in implementing policies to support refugees and IDPs. What role do local authorities have in enabling inclusive pandemic responses? And uh, a question also, if I uh, can bring it up. Um, from Olivia Berthon. Um, on the concluding slide point that COVID-19 could be an opportunity for widening policies that promote rather than prevent mobility, what do you think of the likelihood is of major development donors, such as the EU, making this policy shift in the near future? For example, beyond current limited efforts to prioritize legal migration pathways. Great. Um, sorry, just making a note of the last question. Um, so local authorities, absolutely central. Uh, in, you could argue that local authorities are, are the most essential figures in this whole response because who else is there? I mean, as, as Noor's question suggested, hum, international humanitarian workers and those who are based uh, outside of the localities are largely absent right now. 
um, and, and will remain so for quite some time. So um, I know there's been a lot of discussion about you know, the localiz localization agenda. Does COVID-19 give the localization agenda its much needed boost? Um, there may be some problems with the, that kind of way of thinking, but in some ways, yes, I think that those organizations that have really strong connections to local leaders, whether they're NGO leaders or municipal leaders or, or uh, customary leaders are in a much better position to be able to continue their work uh, through those local actors. And even beyond that, I think action that is instigated by those actors uh, as well is, is stands a much greater chance of being effective. Of course, people are closer to the communities that they're serving, but they're also just there in, in, in ways that um, the rest of us are not. We're all sitting on Zoom talking to each other. Uh, so really centrally important. Olivia's question about how likely are major donors to take this on. I mean, I, I declare a vested interest since I'm uh, leading a big project funded by the EU. I hope some of them are listening. Um, uh, you know, one of our sort of veiled agendas is to try to create new ways of thinking about mobility and the legacy of the EU trust fund, if you like. I mean, we, we take a very specific role with regard to the EU trust fund. It's not, we don't take on policy. We don't comment on the policy of it, but we're trying to really understand the dynamics of intra-regional mobility in the horn. And if we can emerge from that with a more sensitive development policy that understands the need to, for instance, support translocality and people's movement between rural and urban spaces, or the ability for people to gain skills so that they can move within the regions um, effectively with choice and safety. Those kinds of legacies from this work will be absolutely um, valuable. And I think that there are already, without naming names, we've been approached by some donors who said we, are, we want to engage in a conversation about how that happens. So I think there is a growing appetite and a growing awareness that um, that can be, that, that that's the direction that development policy needs to change in. But I think it's going to take a lot of effort and a lot of others uh, who are working in this space to try to bring about that change. Great. So we'll take a few more questions if that's okay. You're happy to take a few more? Sure. Um, okay. yeah. Great. Um, so this is from Wilfred, um, Wilfred Chimtembe. Um, what has been the impact of COVID-19 on minority groups such as women, children, and disabled refugees in camps across the Horn of Africa? Further, what has been the policy response of governments, NGOs, and scholars to the plight of the above groups during the pandemic? And um, so that's quite a Sorry, can you just re repeat the second part of that question again? Yeah. Um, what has been the policy response of governments, okay. NGOs, and scholars to the plight of the above, group, above groups okay. during the pandemic. Yeah. And then uh, a question from, um, we can't move this one, uh, from Al Rahim Musa. Mm -hmm. uh, with regards to Lebanon, where, um, sorry, regards from Lebanon, so it's a salutation, where an increasing number of female Ethiopian migrant workers, mostly housemaids, are being abandoned by their sponsors and literally dropped off at the embassy in Beirut. We've seen this in the newspapers this week. Yeah. This is due to the economic situation nationwide, due to the inflation of the lira against the dollar and the economic effects of COVID-19 lockdown. Does the obligation pass on to the embassy in such situations? Are there more sustainable opportunities or solutions for migrant workers to find, uh, uh, for example, to find other work instead of being returned home and losing their source of remittance income. Okay, so yeah, two questions, um, particularly related to thinking about um, women and other groups. It's very early, it's early to know, I think it's, I haven't seen a hu huge amount of information uh, on the disaggregated impacts, particularly on, a bit on women and men, but not so much on children and certainly as usual, not as much on, on those who are disabled. Um, but we know that, well, to start with uh, those with disabilities, we know that, that people with disabilities tend often in, in refugee and displacement settings to have far lower, poorer access, shall we say, to healthcare, gen to healthcare services generally um, than others. 
Uh, so that's an, a matter of concern. It may also be the case that they're less mobile in some, depending on what, what their form of disability is. Um, and that may be a, a, you know, a small blessing in this matter as well. Um, with regard to the gender differences, um, I mean, it seems to be, uh, it's hard, you know, the public, the epidemiological information about the illness is always changing on a day by day basis, but it seems to be that the illness affects men more than it does women. Uh, that that the, the rates of deaths in particular are higher for men worldwide than they are for women. And a question that I have about the region is knowing that men are more likely to be mobile, to go outside the home, to search for um, jobs, employment, daily labor, to work in their fields, to go to the mosque or the church, uh, those kinds of things, um, whether or not they are at additional risk is, is a question. Um, whereas women tend to be more at home. Um, that's one, so that, that's one possibility. There's more of a risk profile. Another possibility will be that um, women have less access to healthcare because they're in the home. And oh, there's my dog barking. So now you've had the trifecta of interruptions of telephones and notifications and dogs, excuse me. Um, and um, uh, so anyway, so the question, so there can be, and it's not to say one's more than the other. There are different kinds of risks. There are risks to men who are more mo mobile. There are risks, risks to women who may not have access to healthcare as much. There's also a well-documented increase in the incidence of domestic violence being uh, meted against women and one can assume against children as well. Um, that, that, you know, unfortunately it will take time to gather the data and the evidence on what actually is happening. But there are a lot of important questions already that we that are framing based on what we know about what other communities have, have experienced these these problems that um, should lead us to be very concerned about and to look deeply into these questions with these different groups the the question around uh, Ethiopian domestic workers in Lebanon it's a really horrifying um, disturbing stories coming out in the last few days about women being um, dumped uh, outside the embassy because their worker their employers can't um, support can't feed them anymore, basically. Uh, I don't believe they were actually paying them all that much in many cases. But it, and, and there was uh, also really horrific um, accounts of, of, um, of women dying, losing their lives uh, in this instance as well. Um, and I think what that does is shine a light into the whole uh, economy, if you like, of domestic workers from Ethiopia in particular, going to Lebanon, to Saudi Arabia as well, to other Gulf countries with a real lack of protection. Many of them sign up for these kind of sponsored schemes, thinking that it's legal, thinking that they're going to receive an adequate payment that they can send back to their families, only to find when they arrive that their passports are confiscated and they're effectively made slaves. So this is not a new, being dumped outside the embassy is not the new problem. It's the manifestation of a long standing problem that's been going on for quite some time. And, and the question of who bears responsibility ultimately, surely, um, you know, I think the Ethiopian government is trying to find ways of, of supporting, but they're also, you know, they're trying to also address the problem in all of its different stages. So they're dealing with what happens when people come back. They're trying to get information out so that women don't sign up for these schemes in the first place and to crack down on unscrupulous smugglers uh, and agents as well. So, yes, there's a role for the Ethiopian government to play but um, there's also a really important uh, need to try to prevent this practice in the first place, I think. Thank you. Um, so we'll just finish with two questions. Um, now we've kind of given you a lot, you've had to answer quite a lot, um, but there are a lot of questions here. The first one is what is the role of UNHCR in the Horn of Africa now at the current time? Um, and, um, just let me bring up the other one. Um, considering the EU interest in the governance of migration through cooperation, what's the level of cooperation between the African Union and the EU in addressing issues of COVID in the Horn and especially within refugee camps? Okay. Um, the role of UNHCR, UNHCR is obviously, they're extremely active in, in refugee settings. They are, um, you know, have also been really effectively driving what's called the Comprehensive Refugee Response Framework process 
in four countries of the horn. Um, and um, really, uh, I'm sorry, in five countries of the horn, including Turkey. So um, they've been, you know, obviously they, they run refugee camps, they, they facilitate the provision of assistance and, and oversee protection um, in these countries. And they're a huge part of their activities right now, I know are sort of reprogramming the kinds of support that they have to provide as much support as possible to um, refugee populations together with host populations. So um, I guess the answer to the question is that there's the kind of what's being delivered or what kind of funding is being mobilized and that kind of thing, but also the important policy work that UNHCR does at trying to bring forward this comprehensive refugee response framework. And so from their perspective, I can imagine that their, their headaches, if you like, are multiple. So there's the, the headache of trying to um, provide as much support as possible with diminishing funding base uh, to a large extent. Um, they work very closely with the World Health Organization, as we saw on World Refugee Day. Uh, Filippo Grande, the High Commissioner, sat down with Tedros Sadanom and did a joint press conference really outlining what it is they're focusing on um, and how they're responding together to this, this, um, this problem. And, and uh, the High Commissioner for Refugees made the point that they could really do none of what they're doing without the support of the World Health Organization. So it's really important that WHO's funding remains uh, intact. The other piece though is that is that policy framework where they are, in a sense, they are the guardians, the safeguarders of the Global Refugee Compact. And they need to be really conscientious and concerned about the need to make sure that this, that, that what happens with COVID isn't a backtracking of the kind of inclusive policies that we've seen start to build up, particularly in the Horn of Africa and in the Latin America region, which are the two areas where there's been most progress. So I, I think those are the two areas where they should be the most involved. On the last question, I must admit, I, don't, I haven't been privy to the conversations that have gone on between the EU and the AU about COVID itself. Um, I know that they are providing support to the African Union generally. Um, and you know, last year was the, was the year, the Africa Union's year of the refugee returning and displaced person. So they have, they're very much kind of focused on, on those populations. But again, I think that in more operational terms, the focus of the EU, at least as far as the work that I've been doing with them has been really on trying to support EGAD as much as possible to um, be an effective coordination mechanism within the, the affected countries of that region. Laura, thank you. Thank you very much for that, for that great um, and uh, tour de force when it comes to answering the questions and that marvelously stimulating talk. It's clear that your son liked it through the applause. We're not so sure what your dog thought of it, um, but that seemed to be a more amb uh, ambivalent reaction in some yeah, way. Yeah, I think so, probably. <laughs> but I think what you've done is you've take, I mean, you've taken an area where a lot of us had just a kind of hazy view of the effects um, of COVID and the way that it had impacted upon uh, migrants in the Horn of Africa and really built for us a much kind of richer picture of um, the hazards and challenges um, faced by people in the region and the importance of keeping open in many ways by uh, movement and migration options, even during the challenges of COVID. So, I want to thank you for that. It's been really, really um, a fantastic and highly fitting Colson lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So that's the end of our uh, presentation today. Thank you for joining in. Thank you for the marvelous questions, everyone. And we hope to see you at the next um, Colson lecture next year.